how does the satellite actually get the metals inside of it? We'll essentially crash into it at about one meter a second. Does it have like an arm that comes out? To... No. Hey, we launched one at a time right now. What if we bought an entire Falcon 9? We could fit about 20 spacecraft on it. We can dominate the mineral supply chain. So if you were successful in this, will U.S. become the leader in platinum? That's how I become the alien emperor. How are you actually going to extract metals from the asteroids? This is a fun one to talk about, right? Yeah. So the trick of an asteroid is when I get there, and let's let's use a random number that's pretty simple for everybody to understand. Understanding this is like not, not what we're going to run into, but let's say the asteroid is 1% platinum group metals. That means it's 99% shit that's not worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so if I bring it back to Earth, that's just wasted material. So what I have to develop and what we have developed is essentially a machine that can turn 1% platinum group metals into a much higher percentage of platinum group metals. So what I'm returning is worth a lot. You may have seen, actually, there was a pretty famous article that came out, I think about three years ago right now, and it said there's a hundred quadrillion, million, whatever bajillion dollar asteroid out there in the world. It was referring to that asteroid Psyche 16 that I talk about, saying it. And the fallacy with that article is it was just calculating the iron content on, Ash on, on Psyche. Like, you could put that same number on top of Mars. It actually doesn't mean anything. It's not economical to bring back. I'm not trying to mine iron. Like, iron's essentially free on the planet, right? It, the, the cost of iron is actually just the processing cost of it. There's, there's plenty of ore everywhere. There's plenty of nickel everywhere. The thing we want to bring back is platinum. So the way we do it is, first off, we have to land on an asteroid. Now, the trick to landing on an asteroid for us is these are primarily iron, right? They're M-type asteroids or iron-nickel asteroids, which means they should be magnetic. So the way we land on it is, or I should say more dock with it. I mean, try to imagine this, Sean, is at the biggest size, these are 400 meters in diameter, which in relative terms means they're tiny as shit in space. Like, there's really no gravity here. You're not mm -hmm. landing. You're not, we can't even really go into orbit around these asteroids. We almost dock with them like you would dock with the International Space Station. And we use magnets to stick to them. That's how we attach ourselves to the okay. asteroids. Um, I have... There's been a, there's, there's an ESA mission that did a really complicated way to try to grapple onto an asteroid with these hooks, and it was pretty cool, and they spent a lot of money, I think about a billion dollars, trying to figure it out, and it kind of worked. I mean, they were able to do it, but it was a little bit fraught with error. I don't think as a startup I have any other way to land on an asteroid other than to magnetically attach to it. Landing on a piece of dirt or a rubble pile in space that is really small like this is, is next to impossible, or I'm just not smart enough to figure it out for, for, the, for the capital we have. So we land on it. And then How what, close do you have to get to it to, for the magnets to land? Pretty close. I mean, we have to touch the surface, right? We got to touch it. So we'll essentially crash into it at about one meter a second. That's the upper limit of velocity we'll have when we intercept the asteroid. So if you think about it, that's, that's not slow, especially when you think about space hardware and how slow we usually go on space stuff, but it's not fast. It's a pretty low impact that we hit the asteroid with to attach to it. That's what we build the system for. And then what we do is we use a laser system. So we use a laser system to essentially start drilling into the asteroid. We remove the material. So we're removing iron, nickel, and platinum group metals. And then using that same philosophy that iron is magnetic and the platinum group metals are not, we essentially use magnets to reject the iron. And we keep the platinum group metals inside the spacecraft. It's a pretty simple approach to do it. Now keep in mind, I'm 10 million miles away and I'm a startup. If I start coming out here with, we got robot arms and we got conveyor belts and like, it's just not gonna happen. I mean, if you look at any spacecraft, they're hard enough to fly when shit isn't moving. And then when you start to add mechatronics to it, like they're next to impossible, right? I mean, look at the arm that we developed that, that not we actually, Canada did, MDA on the, on the space shuttle. Like, that was a, a huge undertaking to get two actuators to work correctly. Like it's really hard to do that in space. So we just can't do it. I, I don't wanna have the team, keeping it simple is part of one of, the, is, is one of the biggest philosophies we have at the company. And so we'll store that and then we just essentially launch the spacecraft back at Earth. There's nothing special here. We crash into the atmosphere, use a heat shield to burn off kinetic energy and recover the material. In fact, the really cool thing about a spacecraft that's just mining and doesn't do any scientific exploration is I don't have to have all these weird constraints. It doesn't have to land nicely, right? It doesn't have to have nice parachutes that come out to slow you down really slow so I don't like hurt my precious cargo. In fact, I don't think we're gonna use parachutes. What we're probably going to use is if, you remember when you were a kid and you would launch little model rockets and then have streamers? Mm -hmm. Probably just gonna use a streamer uh, to slow it down enough so that when it impacts the ground, the metal is recoverable. And like being able to remove those constraints of, of scientific 
instrumentation and, and value collection from it really opens up the envelope here. Wow. One thing that's a little bit crazy that I don't think a lot of people realize, you may not as well, is we've already mined asteroids before. We have? Like the Japanese, JAXA, has done this twice, and NASA has done it once. So the Japanese did it with a mission called Hayabusa 1 and Hayabusa 2. Um, they both went out to asteroids, took samples from them, and brought it back to Earth. And Osiris Rex went out to an asteroid called Bennu, which is how we really found out about these rubble piles, right? Bennu was a really cool asteroid. I think it was about a, a kilometer and a half in size. And uh, it was just a whole bunch of essentially little particles stuck together with static electricity. And so if you ever watched the landing of Osiris Rex, or landing, I call it landing because they didn't really land. They just like sunk into the surface. And then this is where NASA does extremely good job, and I don't think anybody else can do it to this level. They thought it was fucking solid. They go to land and they start sinking into the surface, but they had thought through this and had a theory that maybe it wasn't solid. What could we do? And we're actually able to like not just destroy the spacecraft by going into some random dirt. They, they backed up, they re-went around it, they re rethought about it, and were able to still grab a sample and complete the mission. Cybers Rex returned a sample about a year ago now uh, that came back in a small capsule to, to be recovered. I think we recently, we recently opened it up. It was really difficult for, for us to open for some reason. Um, but so... We understand the physics to all this. There isn't some like physics barrier we have to get past to mine an asteroid. This is simply, can we do it cheaper and economically to make it work? No kidding. Wow. So how does the satellite actually get the metals inside of it? I mean, I, I get the, the magnetism and pushing the iron and all the other shit away. What do you, does it have like an arm that comes out? To no, in fact, it? the metal uh, and the way we do it with ring magnets is the, the platinum group metals flow up through the middle of the spacecraft and essentially are trapped in a very small mylar bag. This isn't a lot of volume to bring back, right? If you think about it, platinum group metals are some of the most densest elements on Earth. It's a third of a meter cubed. It's, it's not a big amount of material. That's, so, did you say it's a thousand kg? A thousand kg is a third of a meter cubed of PGMs. It's not a. It's not a lot of That's volume. That's it. It's pretty small. The shit's really dense. That's why it's worth a lot of money, yeah, right? It's yeah. like it's, it's a very dense element that we're going after these six elements. So it kind of works out perfectly to be the first one we bring back. And then obviously, Sean, as we look at it, like platinum is where we're starting. As prices change, as we're able to lower spacecraft, as we start thinking about things like, hey, we launched one at a time right now. What if we bought an entire Falcon 9? We could fit about 20 spacecraft on it. What if we bought an entire Starship? We could fit, I don't know how many, but I'm sure it's a shitload of spacecraft on it, right? And like, as these technologies advance and, and we get lower cost into space, uh, we can do a lot more for cheaper. And then other metals start to meet that price threshold, right? You have indium, you have... Indium. Indium is an element that's in pretty high concentration on these metal asteroids. We have quite a few of the rare earth elements on these, on these metal asteroids. Um, you can look at nickel, you can look at iron, you can look at cobalt, right? You can look at these different elements and see when do they hit the price threshold where it makes sense to actually bring them back. And if you're, so if you're targeting asteroids that take two years or less to get to, so you're looking at about roughly four years, correct? No, no, two years or less round trip. Round trip. Two years or less round trip. All the asteroids we keep on the board, nine months or less to get to three months to mine them and a year to come back. It's always a little bit longer to come back because we're heavier and we leave slowly. Um, so yeah, two years round trip is what we look at. That's what we cap it at. Why do you, why do you think it take, why three months? Why does it take three months? That is what, so anytime you're going to build a system like this, I got to give the team constraints, mm -hmm. right? I got to say like, it's really easy when we're talking about a laser based mining system, it's a linear trade between time and power. So when I say we have three kilowatts on the spacecraft, and we have three months. You now know how much material you have to remove. It's really easy to say, oh, we have, three we have three kilowatts. Well, I could use known techniques that work really well and just sit there for 10 years. But then I got to build a spacecraft that can last in space for 10 plus years. That's actually really hard to do. So I've given the team the constraint of three kilowatts, three months. It's a pretty arbitrary constraint, Sean. I'm not going not gonna to say like there's a whole bunch of science that goes into it. Mm -hmm. What there is science that goes into is the two years or less. And that has to do with radiation tolerance of the spacecraft, right? The electronics on board can only handle so much radiation before they will start to fail at high rates. And that high rate failure in our spacecraft will start to happen around the three-year mark with what we use today. So I want to make sure in two years we're back on Earth and safe, and then all the components can fail once we're back on the ground. Right on. Will you be able to reuse these or rebuild them? Absolutely not. Them? I, no, we have no plans to reuse them. Okay. Um, I mean, we're going to fucking crash land them, right? Like, 
keeping them light, keeping them cheap is pretty important to us at this point in time. And the economic use case for satellites at that scale that can be reusable is extremely difficult to make work, I think, if, if not impossible. I think when you start looking at starship level reusability in these kind of massive structures, sure, you can talk about massive reusability when you're, you're putting a lot of capex into one of these projects. The reality is, man, I'm not Elon Musk. I don't have, you know, $50 billion behind me. I can just dump into one of these. I have to think really economical at the beginning. And like, part of this is having the economic constraint as well. If we had unlimited money, we know how to mine an asteroid. It's called Osiris Rex. It costs $1.2 billion. Uh, you know, it, it's really easy to iterate to that works. That's a solution. It's not an economical business though. We have to think cheap. We have to think light. And we have to make those trades all the time of like cost is in every trade study we do. And it's not a common thing for engineers to see. Most engineers are like, oh, you know, what, what's, what's the feature? What's the requirement? How much do I get out of this? But like cost is the, a big part of what we look at on every spacecraft build we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who, who all is interested in, in what you're doing? I think there's a, well, I'll put like, it in three like categories. Who, who's going to benefit? I mean, who, who you sell the metal to? That kind of stuff. Yeah, so the metal, we're going after a commodity. So the nice part is it's like, we have about $8 billion in, in offtake agreements right now. And they're kind of comical because it says like, if you bring me $8 billion in platinum, I will buy it from you. Like, it's really easy to sell this into the commodity market that will then be used. So who's gonna benefit from it? Tesla, Boeing, Nvidia, like every company that now has access to a US source base of platinum group metals. I should make one thing really clear. We don't have a lot of platinum group metals in the United States. As we expand, platinum group metals, if we continuously use it the way we use it in the United States, we'll run out of it by, by 2035. Now, the reality is the globalization on the world, that's not how it works. And we come up with these deals and, you know, half of this is like us posturing to other countries. And we've even seen this with rare earth, right? So, I mean, if you follow the news, it's like every other day, China is giving us rare earth, so they're not. And I can't really keep track and we keep negotiating back and forth. And it's like, this is how economies work. And this is actually a really beneficial way for economies to work. The next wave of this will be in platinum group metals. It's probably one of the most dangerous things that I foresee that we're coming up against because it's one of the critical building blocks to what we do and the United States doesn't have any. So if you do this, I mean, how many other platinum mines are there in the world? Is there a ton of them or is there not very many? There's a whole plethora of them in South Africa. Mm -hmm. There's quite a bit in Russia. China has a couple. I don't know the exact number though, but I, there's quite a few of them. Well, so if you're successful in this, will U.S. become the leader in platinum? U.S. will become dominant in platinum. In fact, I'm going to say this differently. 3% of global carbon emissions are caused by platinum group metal mining alone because it's so deep, right? Because it's so deep, it's so hard to access, it requires so much to get it out. What if I told you a story of the future where we provide it from space at a fraction of the carbon cost? to the point where platinum group metal mining on the planet becomes banned. That's what I think the future holds for mining, especially wow. on these critical elements. It's like, as soon as we can show that there's an economically feasible, reliable way to secure minerals from space, earth-based mining becomes regulated out of existence. And so what Astroforge can become one day is one of the first regulated monopolies, right? We can dominate the mineral supply chain and also have laws in place where nobody else can dominate it. That's how I become the alien emperor. <laughs> no matter where you're watching Sean Ryan show from, if you get anything out of this, please like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this everywhere you possibly can. And if you're feeling extra generous, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts.